Good afternoon. Today I'm talking to Charlie Gallagher, who has written a George Elm thriller series and has started a new series. Good afternoon, Charlie. And um, would you like to tell us a little bit more about yourself and your journey to become a writer? Yeah, thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, really nice to be talking to you. So again, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I've um, I've written a couple of series as it stands. George Elms was the first, uh, and it was a series of of seven uh, seven thrillers, crime thrillers. Uh, and then I've written the Maddie Ives series, which is a series of six six books. Um, and the sixth and final one went out uh, earlier this year. Uh, and since then, I've been approached by um, Avon, so changing publishers to Avon, who are part of Harper Collins, uh, which was a fantastic opportunity for me. The previous two series were with Joffy Books, who um, fantastic again, really lucky to to be working with and involved with them. Uh, but for now, I'm, I'm focusing on, on a new series. Um, and the first one with Avon will come out on April the 1st uh, to be called The Friend uh, and is up for, for pre-order. I think it's it's 99p. I know it's 99p. Uh, so looking forward to that. And then a second one will follow a few months after. Uh, in relation to my writing story, I've it's something I've always, always done. Uh, seriously, really, for the last five years. Uh, this one that comes out in April will be my 15th book. So published book. So um, I'm kind of established. I think that's the right word, uh, or at least I've got a fair few out there now. Uh, and for 13 years, I was a police officer. Um, and as, as part of that role, I, I was the response officer as we all start off. Uh, but I also worked as a detective uh, on the search team and in counterterrorism. So quite a varied career. Uh, and obviously that, that very much fuels the writing. Uh, a big reason I joined the police in the first place was to get more material. Uh, I didn't mention that in my interview. I, th I thought better of it, but um, that is absolutely the case. And um, it's obviously, it's, it's, it's served me very well. It was a wonderful career. And I left only a few months ago now um, when the writing, it kind of got to the point where it was, it was uh, concentrate on the writing and really go for it, obviously with the offer from the new, new publisher or, um, or continue doing it on the side. And, it's a real struggle so um always dreamed of being a full-time author so i thought if i didn't then i it would be something that i would regret probably for the rest so uh it felt like the right time to to give it a go so we shall see but um yeah so far very enjoyable wonderful career and um he's hoping it lasts a lot longer <laughs> And then when you wrote your first George Elm book, did you plan on it being a series and the same for your Maddie Ives? Yes, absolutely. I, I like uh, series writing. I like um, reading series. I like the development of characters that it, that it allows. Uh, my books are between 100 and 120,000 words generally. And that's not actually a long time to develop uh, a character, um, tell a story, and provide closure and a, and a proper character arc and all the rest of the things that, that people want. So um, I love the idea of, of um, introducing main characters that, that then people get to know over, over the course of a series. You can sort of drip feed and develop them as you go. And also characters change you know, when they go through, through traumatic experiences and, and they definitely do in my books. I really put them through the mill. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that changes who they are as a person. And, and in the next book, they might still be uh, affected by what they've seen by the traumas from the previous and, and the readers get to share in that and I think by the end of a series I've had some lovely comments about um, both series about how the, that they feel like they're you know they pick up a, the, the latest one and it's like you know friends that they've they're catching up with you know a lovely comment to have and, and um, I've seen that in a few reviews so that's what I look for in a series and that's the reason why I um, I wrote or I write generally series there was one stand learning amongst that, which was just to see if I could. Uh, and that one's called Ruthless and, and um, I thoroughly enjoyed it as, a, uh, as an exercise. And I certainly wouldn't rule out doing a, a standalone again, a, a short, sharp story with, with, um, with characters and new characters, I should say. Absolutely. But yeah, I think I'll, um, I'm certainly going to carry on with the series writing for now. Do you find it hard to, harder to write the first book in a series or the subsequent ones? The first George Gems series was, was relatively easy because everything was brand new. And then the Maddie Ives series uh, was more difficult. 
because uh, you want characters that, that sound different, that are different to, um, to what you've had before. And then this last series is the first one of that series is the hardest one I think I've written uh, for, the, for the same reasons. You want it to be new and different. Uh, and writing this series is, is, is um, you get really sort of, you get to know your character so well. <clears throat> You know, by the sixth Maddie Ives series, I could walk Maddie or Harry into any scene, uh, any situation. I know exactly how they're going to react, even what they're going to say. And it sounds a bit odd, but because uh, I know they're not real people, I, I do know they're not real, but <laughs> but they feel it to an extent, and I know how they're going to act and what they're going to say and do. And then when you start on a new series, you're making decisions that will last however long the series lasts. I mean, I've written a six and a seven book series. This one will be there or thereabouts, if not longer. And you, so you're making decisions and creating characters that you're going to have to uh, continue with for, for that long, you know, the type of person that they are, where they live, cars they drive, everything is, you know, is, is around to stay. It's, it's difficult. You can overthink it. I think I do that a little bit, uh, certainly with this new one, because it's a, a different publisher and it feels like a big opportunity. I've been, you know, trying to get it as right as I can, but um, it's difficult but fun at the same time. Yes, I'm glad you said that as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you inspired by any authors? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think there was one author that made me realise I wanted to write seriously, and that was uh, Simon Koenig. Uh, I don't know if that's someone you've heard of, but I, I think he's Love wonderful. Simon and <laughs> brilliant. Yeah, he, he was kind of, um, I read a lot of stuff, and he was the first one that he really grabs you by the, intimate parts from <laughs> from the beginning of a book and then drags you through and, and I'd not seen that before uh, you know the pace I think the first one I read was the last 10 seconds and it uh, or um or relentless one of the two and it felt like it was absolutely relentless and like you'd read it in 10 seconds it, it was brilliant and um so he he's very inspirational and I try and have pace in in my books and you can't keep the pace up the whole way through and and you know nor should you because bless them the readers need a bit of a rest but I do like to have, uh, you know, quick scenes. Uh, beyond that, I think Stuart McBride for uh, descriptive work. Um, I don't think there's anyone better at, at setting a scene. Um, every time I, I write a scene and set it and then I go back and read the Stuart McBride book, I, I end up quitting writing. It, you know, I think, <laughs> I think he might be just about uh, the best there for that. Um, and there are others that, are, that I like and pick bits out, but for inspiration, I'd, I'd probably pick out those two. Um, would you write in any other genres? Yes, I'm, I'm writing a, a children's book. Uh, I say children, it's kind of like a, a 9 to 12, I think would be the um, uh, the age group. I grew up reading Raoul Dahl, who, who probably still stands as my favourite writer of all time. And I still read the books sometimes. I've got two two young girls and, and I read the books to them and with them. And uh, that is a genre that I really like. And obviously having, having um, kids as well during the first lockdown, uh, we, I sat down with the eldest who, who's seven years old and we, we started working on a story and um, it kind of progressed from there really. And now I, some days I'll spend the mornings writing about horrible, gruesome murders and then the afternoons writing about aliens hidden in a pigeon suit that can't <laughs> fart without a whistle coming out. So it's a very, my days can be very surreal sometimes. It's a very strange job I do now. <laughs> but uh, it's brilliant, uh, you know, I think you need that sometimes because writing crime is a bit grim. Uh, and there was a time when I was going to work for 12 hours a day and uh, obviously living and breathing crime as a police officer and then coming home and writing about it. And I'd try and read books that are popular and watch shows for to make sure that that side of things, you know, I keep inspired. So it was just all police work and all horrible. Um, so, yeah, it's nice to have the odd uh, farting alien to write about. <laughs> um, what's the funniest thing that ever happened to you when you were a police officer the funniest oh goodness yeah. me nothing I can talk about they're all they're all terrible <laughs> horrible things that if relatives ever heard they, they would be absolutely uh, I don't know really there was there's an incident with the dog and a fire extinguisher which was which was I'll tell very briefly which is basically we I used to work on a search team and and what that is is a search and strike team. So we did a lot of the drug warrants and we've gone on our way to a warrant and um, the, we had a, a relative, a new constable with us and he, he was tasked with a dog. We knew they had a dangerous dog, horrible thing. 
So we gave him the fire extinguisher because what works really well on dangerous dogs is you, you squirt them with a, with a powder fire extinguisher. And even the most vicious dogs will, will generally back down. Don't take that for granted if you're ever in that position. But generally, so he got the fire extinguisher. And um, so anyway, he pulls up at the property. Sure enough, the dog comes out barking at us. And uh, he swung the fire extinguisher like a baton. So no one had explained to him that what we meant was squirt the dog. Don't hit it around the face. So that didn't go so well. Luckily, the dog wasn't injured. I should say that because he wasn't. But um, he didn't attack us. <laughs> <laughs> no. Another one, uh, again, sorry if I could just jump in with a, um, a drug one. Goodness me, this was after I'd, the first book was published and it, it was a standing joke. Everyone called me JK Rowling for about four years. Uh, and we, we hit a door and went through the house and um, shouting police, police, because obviously that's what, that's what we do. And then we got to the back and the poor fella was, was in the toilet. And uh, so we keep the door in because, you know, that's what we do, because he could have been flashing evidence and he wasn't, bless him, he, he, he wasn't. He was sat down. Yeah. So we burst in and I grab one arm and my mate grabs the other arm and we're holding him on the toilet and he's, you know, he's doing what he does. And the, my mate looks at me and he says, it's just going in the book, isn't it? <laughs> it didn't. It never made it because I'm not sure it fits with the genre that I write in. <laughs> Maybe with the aliens. <laughs> yeah. yeah but i mean it was a, it was a good career it's a lovely bunch of people um you know police officers in general they're, they're wonderful people i know they get a bad rap but don't believe all you read in the media no oh, yeah i know um yeah we um in my old job i had quite a lot of dealings with police and they're always great so yeah i i don't think that they deserve their reputation sometimes what was your old job was you a burglar <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, if you want to be in forensics, you can't have a criminal record, so don't. No, true. <laughs> I used to work at... <laughs> no. <laughs> I used to work at a petrol station, so drive-offs okay, yeah, frequently, all the time, drive-offs. So we had the police a lot because they came to collect yeah. CCTV and stuff, so yeah. And then My mate worked... built... So I worked next to a truck stop. Um, oh, right. the, near a motorway junction. So again, we had um, illegal immigrants in the backs of lorries quite frequently as well. Yes, so. yes. yes. Yeah, it was imagine. fun. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> what were you going to say? Sorry, is your, your oh, mate? Oh, I was just going to say that. Yeah, we was in a marked car, both in uniform, and I bought a pack of sandwiches and he filled the car up, got back and he drove off. He bilked, officially. <laughs> he totally forgot. He never lived that down. It was a lot of donuts he had to buy. <laughs> But the poor petrol attendant had to phone up and say, uh, yeah, we just had a drive off. Uh, Mark, police car. Brilliant. <laughs> Never mind. It wasn't um, me. Yeah. I would have loved <laughs> to have made that phone call. I would have been laughing my head off. Yeah, I think they were, yeah. yeah. We, had, um, Never mind. we had a guy once that stole and we saw that he'd stolen and then um, he got back into a marked van. So we rang his company and said, oh. we've just seen one of your employees stealing. So uh, yeah, they made him come back and pay for it. And I think he got fired as well. Oh, so, right, yeah, well. Yeah. Uh, how stupid can you get? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, that was a fun job. And uh, we had an incident with um, a Romany gypsy as well, but yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, not pleasant. Um, where were we? Uh, so have you used um, any sort of instance from your career in your books? Obviously not, you know, exactly, but <laughs> inspired. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, um, the crimes, the, the main sort of uh, narrative, are, they're, obviously they're fiction, all made up. Uh, the characters are, are clearly the, the baddies and the goodies are all made up, but um, you do pick bits from... From people that you know and you've met of course you do i mean the the detectives are based on a couple of people that i know and have worked with uh, uh the criminals quite often the same you know you you see um you meet a lot of criminals obviously you know that's kind of the nature of the job so it would be difficult not to pick bits of them uh the other thing I, well maybe i might have an advantage if you can call it that is is um i describe scenes where i'm turning up to for example a a, a body you know it's a crime thriller so it may well happen uh, you know, when I write that, it's from experience. I, I've done that. You know, I found um, murder victims in in fields when I was part of a search team and uh, and and other 
scenarios that I write about, I've seen, you know, there was one, I wrote a fella was, was beaten with a baseball bat. And again, I've seen that, the outcome of that. And, and um, I don't know if advance is the right word, but you know what I mean? It adds a little bit of, of, of authenticity. And so those experiences come into the writing and, and also uh, witnesses, the way that witnesses react to, I mean, I've given a death message. It's the worst part of, of, of the job. It was, it was awful, as you can imagine, you know, turn up on someone's door at three o'clock and taking your hat off and, and giving them the news um, that a relative has died. But I, I have done. And, and again, in, in the books, there, there's obviously, there's always relatives and witnesses and, and people that know the victim. And, and I feel like I write from a, a place of authenticity when, when I write about them as well. So, um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of experiences bleed over into the books. Of, you know, of course they do. And I think every author brings their own experiences, whatever they may be. It doesn't have to be a, a policing background. Do you um, think that you have to do less research because you've got that background or do you still need to thoroughly research? Yes, I do. And it catches me out a little bit because um, I will, uh, the procedural stuff, which is the least interesting part of policing, it's, it's absolutely mind numbing, the paperwork. Uh, sometimes in the books, I, I do, I don't skip it. No, I do. I skip it. That's exactly what I mean. But I don't necessarily, <laughs> I read some authors and I think, blimey, their procedure is amazing. Mine isn't because um, I think it's a little bit boring. Uh, and also other, other authors will put in procedural stuff that, that where they, they've researched from, there are textbooks and manuals on how police work. In real life, that's not how the police work. You know, there, there are corners that are cut. And, we, you know, there are some things I've, every single time I read a murder in a book, there's a pathologist that comes out. I've never seen a pathologist in my whole career. Uh, so, you know, so there are things that I think in a perfect world, that, that's exactly how it works. So I have to be careful that, that readers, crime readers are very intelligent people. They know police procedure inside and out because, you know, the amount of stuff that they read, they're very clever. They're kind of almost like experienced coppers, you know, in, in what they know. Uh, so I have to be careful to be true to them uh, and to make sure that actually my mind procedurally is, is correct. And I haven't skipped out any of the, any of the bits that they would expect. And I'm not losing authenticity, which is strange for some of my background. But um, but yeah, then I read someone like um, Peter James, for example, whose procedure is amazing. And I think, blimey, maybe I should put in a little bit more of, of the other side of things that we do, you know, because I'm sort of, you know, I, I feel like I know it. So sometimes you, you get a little bit lapsed. Yeah, I need to work on that. <laughs> um, do you, are you a big planner? Um, of your books or are you a pantser do you see how they go yeah I'm definitely the second one I don't plan a thing I uh I'll, I'll have a few dog walks before I start a book or I'll drink in the bath that's another place I seem to think I don't know why um with a few, you know have a, have a glass of wine in the bath or something and then I, I generally have a central idea it can either be a beginning a middle or an ending it's sometimes just a scene and then I'll either um, write it down and then write away from that or if it's an ending I'll write towards it well, that's the thing with writing a series once you you have characters in your mind well affirmed you can literally put them in any story and they will sort of drive it if that makes sense um whereas uh yeah so i, I don't really need to to plan i never have and it, i'm what am i now 15 in so i don't think <laughs> i ever will <laughs> yeah it must be working all right for you <laughs> yeah it seems to be yeah and i, I tend to, i know planners that will pretty much work out chapter by chapter where they're going they spend three or four months planning and then the same again writing and you know that, that's not for me I, it's but everybody's everybody's different and uh, the part of the thrill for me the reason why I enjoy it so much is that I'll start a book and I've got no idea how it ends uh, <laughs> you know until so I'm, I'm working out as, as I go through which is I think you know a lovely way to do it. Uh, what was the moment when you thought um, this is it I've made it as an author? Oh, blimey, there's, there's a few big moments. Uh, the, I, rem I very much fluked my first um, publishing deal with Joffy. I was uh, self-publishing at the time and I sent my third book as it was then off to, a, uh, to an editor because you always have to get it edited, I, I would suggest. And then um, she, Joffy Books were looking for new editors and she sent off my work as an example. And they asked after it and said, who, who is this and who's he? publishing with and at the time obviously I wasn't so they put us together and and that's how that that began uh and then Avon as well they uh, uh one of the 
young ladies that worked for Avon approached me over, over Twitter, of all things. So, you know, that was a big moment as well, saying that I think that probably stands out. I think when Avon, who are part of HarperCollins, one of the biggest publishers in the world, have heard of you even, you know, that, that feels like, like quite a moment. So, um, yeah, there's been a few. And I've, I've never had an agent. I know that's that's quite important for a lot of writers. I've never um, been represented. It's always been me sort of chancing my arm, being a bit cheeky and and getting very lucky. Um, but I mean, obviously getting the, the books come when they start coming through as books and they look real and you get to touch them and stuff and, and go to bed with them on your pillow. It, that's a, you know, <laughs> that's a big moment. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, when I realized I was an author, obviously quitting the police, That that's probably, my most exciting and terrifying moment all rolled into one. I remember walking away from the police station when my um, notice period was gone, thinking I'm a, I'm a full-time writer. You know, that it was amazing and terrifying at the same time. Uh, you know, that's how, like I say, that long may it continue. <laughs> What's this here with another question I've forgotten? Um, Is it about the aliens? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, give me time. <laughs> oh. No, can't remember. Um, so it wasn't an important it, one then, was it? It can't have been. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm surprised I could even speak because. <laughs> oh. It was linked to their series, and I just can't. This is what happens when I go off my written questions and try and think of ones. Um, that was it. Do you have lots more books um, in your head that you want to write or does an idea come to you and then you write it? Uh, it seems it's odd for me. There's, there's a very familiar structure that seems to have formed. I don't know why. Uh, and that will be that I, I only ever have one idea at a time. Uh, and the, the idea for the next one seems to come to me towards the end of the one before, if that makes sense. Uh, I don't know why. It's it's lovely, because I get to the point where I'm starting to panic. Uh, I'm thinking, oh, I've got you know, I've literally got no ideas. I'll have to work on the on the uh, the alien in the pigeon suit idea. Uh, <laughs> and then um, generally, like I said, I take a, a few dog walks with some loud music, and and I I quite often I've got a few ideas that have been in there for a while, and sometimes one pops out and it's a bit more developed than others, and then you go with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, that's, that's all part of the fun for me. I never know what they're going to be about. I mean, I've covered a lot of very different subjects uh, and I wouldn't say that they're the standard police procedural in some ways. Um, they're, they're more sort of thrillers where the, um, the victims and witnesses can, can drive the narrative a little bit more than the police in, in some, on some occasions, certainly for parts of the book um, until the police catch up with what's going on. Or um, So I like to move the point of view around a lot. When I tell a story, it's it's from different points of view. I don't stick with just the police, which I've seen done quite a lot, and absolutely right that that's done. And it, when it's done well, it's fantastic. It's just not the way I write. Uh, so yeah, I'll have. Um, I'm generally full of ideas or full of something, uh, and what but one will stick out as as being one worthy of developing. You know, and and uh, I've, I've had a few blind alleys. I've abandoned books before, but never really when I've done too much, you know, I'm a couple of thousand words in and I think it's not, it's not got the legs uh, and then I'll ditch it and move on. But um, very rarely, I'm very lucky. <laughs> or just very clever. Yeah, lucky. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you're gonna have a dinner party and you can invite four famous people who you have in round. <laughs> four famous people? Well, probably a chef, just because, you know. <laughs> you could get takeaway. Uh, yes, all right, then we'll get takeaway. Um, <laughs> I like Ricky Gervais, I'm a massive fan of his. Um, it may sound like an obvious one. One, I think he'd be good fun. But uh, I think as, as a writer, which might be strange from a crime writer, but um, I think he writes incredible stuff. He puts them out as comedy, but they're drama, really. Uh, fantastic. And he, he evokes all sorts of emotions in the stuff that he does. And... Uh, and that's all I want to do. When I when I put a story out, all I want is 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 the reader to feel something, you know, as a result of of what they're reading. And, and I think that's a good starting point. And he does that. Um, Noel Gallagher, just because they're amazing, is the best band in the world. And I'm a big <laughs> fan of, of Noel's. 
Uh, probably someone like Lee Evans or Peter Kay. I'm sticking with the comedians here. Just because they'd be good fun, wouldn't they? And then I'd have to have someone that would eat more than me because I've got a massive appetite and I don't want to be the one that they all talk about. When I, when, you know what I mean? When, the, when I go to the toilet, they're all saying, he's a bit of a glutton, isn't he? So I'd have to have... <laughs> I don't know, who do you think would eat a lot? I don't know. What's his name? Johnny That's Vegas. Nice. Johnny Vegas. Nice. We'll stick with the other comedian and we'll have Johnny <laughs> Vegas. Yeah. Yeah, Great John Vegas. He lost his weight though, didn't he, Johnny Vegas? Oh, he's no good. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know now then. Someone who eats a lot. That'll You're not going to have a woman to balance it out. Yes, all right. Very male-dominated <laughs> party, this one. Yeah, it would be a bit, it would be. Who would we have? <laughs> J.K. Rowling's too obvious. And I'm I'm very jealous of, of um, J.K. Rowling, obviously. Yeah, I think millions uh, are. <laughs> yeah, well, she's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. In fact, I'm just reading her um, Galbraith Cuckoo's Call and I've just got that one. Oh, um, yeah, I've still got that to read, yeah. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't read any of those yet, but I'm, I hear they're very, it's very huge, good. It's huge, isn't it, apparently? Yes, yes, which is not a bad thing if it's good. No, not. Not. Uh, who's the young lady that plays Villanelle? I can't remember her name. She'd be great. I've always wanted her to play Maddie Ives if they ever made the, you know, because they will obviously make it into a TV series. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember her name. No, I don't know. I'm useless. I read, I don't watch TV. Generally, I'm rubbish with knowing. I do, obviously, I do watch some, but if anyone yeah, asks me, I'm like, honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> No, oh, I can't remember her name. Who else might I have? Yeah, I'm not too sure. Uh, no, I can't think of anything. Mine's gone blank. <laughs> Villa now. Yeah, we'll stick with her as the fictional version. Okay. Because that'll be exciting because she's she's an assassin, isn't she? So you know, it might you never know. It might be one one guest less by the end. As long as it wasn't you. <laughs> yes, well, yeah. Yeah, that would be the worst dinner party ever, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Usually I say I'd like to be a fly on the wall, but actually I think I'd leave you to that one. <laughs> Especially if, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have any unusual uh, quirks or talents? Any party tricks? Uh, no, I don't think so, really. I mean, all, all of my... um. Working career kind of has been the police. So, I mean, there was uh, there wasn't much time to develop much else. Unfortunately, I used to be reasonable at football. I signed for Chelsea when I was a, as a schoolboy. Obviously, that didn't come to fruition. But who wants to be a footballer anyway? I mean, they're all unhappy. So uh, <laughs> yeah, with their millions, they must be yeah. so miserable. Yeah, poor souls. Yeah, Rubbish. I'd much rather uh, be a, a writer. It's far more um, rock and roll than, yeah. than a footballer. Well, at least you uh, but no, no, no. Well, sort of. But um, no discernible talents, which is really quite disturbing when you say it out loud. Nothing quirky, I don't think. No real party tricks. I mean, no. you can write books, so you have one talent at least. You know, yes, you've well, scenes, so that's, you know, that's yeah. pretty impressive. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. All right, I'll stick with that. I love the, the books. And obviously, um, you know, in the police, I was uh, on a search team and a train medic and an advanced driver and all that sort of thing, which was all good fun. But um, probably doesn't really count as talent because, you know, anyone can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> You're just very modest, I guess. <laughs> no, no. If, I, if I'm good at something, I'd have told you. I'd have shouted it out. I'd have done a little dance routine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dance is one thing I can't do. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you friends with lots of authors? Uh, I wouldn't say lots. I, the, the Joffy was uh, with Joffy Books when I was working with them, and I'm sure I will continue to work with Joffy. There's there's a really nice atmosphere among the among the authors, and I'm sure that'll be the same when when I get in amongst um, uh, Avod. Obviously, we've not been able to meet anyone since since I I signed with them, so that's been a bit different. But uh, with Joffy, we had Christmas parties and get-togethers so uh, that's Joy Ellis and who's fantastic Helen Durant again very very uh, excellent writer uh, Stu Giles was in there he's a, he's a very funny fellow uh, funny fellow and and a, a good friend 
he must write a book a month. His incredible outlet output from him. Uh, a fellow called TJ Breerton, who is a US-based um, author, but we still speak fairly regular, uh, sort of on email and social media and stuff. He writes really atmospheric crime thrillers. Um, I really like his stuff. Uh, and also he's a, he's a lovely fella, so that's that's handy. So sort of all the Joffy authors. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting to, to know Avon. I mean, authors in general seem to be a, a certain a certain bunch. You know, they're all really nice people. They're all very supportive of each other. I think we all understand how difficult the industry is uh, as a whole. And if you've um, got to the point where you're being published, you're, I think, in the massive minority and doing very, very well or very lucky, as in my case. Uh, yeah, so I think we're all very supportive of each other. If you've been to any of the festivals like Harrogate and those sorts of things? Yeah, I went to a crime fest, crime fest in 2019. I was due to go this year and obviously that, that didn't quite happen. Uh, that's the one in Bristol. Um, loved Bristol. Bristol's a lovely place and we, we spent a long weekend down there and I was on a few panels with one with Joy Ellis, which was good. Uh, and one with Callie Taylor, who is CL Taylor, who is now oh, with yeah. Avon who writes psychological thrillers. Yeah, she had one out at the time. She was, she was very nice. Um, yeah, I met a, a few. I met a Scandi author as well. And I, I, goodness me, I forget his name, but he, he was, I read a book after, which was awesome. Uh, he does the sort of Scandi noir stuff and he's been around for a long time. And it's terrible, I can't remember his name. But um, well, it's a bit really complicated, isn't it, if they're Scandi? They're like that long, yeah, aren't they, it usually? Was, <laughs> it was quite long, but I don't think it was, it's, it's something that should stick in my mind. I know it certainly did for a while, but, uh, yeah, I, I like doing stuff like that, and I hope to do more of that now that writing is kind of my thing full time. I'll be going to um, to more and more when they come back, obviously, uh, which hopefully will be very soon. Yeah, I hope so, because I haven't met anyone, and I want to meet everyone. So the only way I'm oh, going to do it is yeah. I know. I suppose. I've, I mean, I've read since I was a kid, but only this year I sort of started speaking to authors, and I want to meet them, and I can't because you know the world went crazy. So. <laughs> It did, but, but you should. I tell you, it, it's wonderful when, when people come up to you and, and want to talk to you about your stuff. It's, it's amazing. I, I, you know, I can't even put it into words. It, it's, um, and I'm sure all authors absolutely love it. So, yeah, if you can get yourself to a lit festival or, um, yeah, I'm sure it'll be very well, very well received. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was supposed to be going to um, Killer Women, which was in London. Um, I can't yeah. remember who was there, but it sounded awesome. And then obviously it got cancelled. So, yeah. I, I was, uh, I, I remember walking to Bristol Crime Fest and Martina Cole was out the front having a cigarette. Unbelievable. I looked at her and I pointed and I said, Martina Cole. And she went, yeah. <laughs> I ruined that moment, didn't I? <laughs> I was trying to be cool, but I couldn't. I mean, she's an absolute legend and clearly, for all the right reasons, absolutely wonderful author and um, yeah, an absolute legend. She was kind of the, the, the special guest, celeb guest type, type thing. And uh, yeah, she, Martina Cole just sat there. Just like it was normal to sit there. I don't know what people do when they're that famous, but I didn't think they just sat there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's interesting actually. I spoke to Kerry Richardson and um, she she said she was at Harrogate and Lee Child walked past her and said, hi, yep. Kerry. And she was just like, hi, Lee. And then that was it and just carried on. But she's like, it was Lee Child. <laughs> like, yeah, and, was, and yeah, so apparently just, just play it cool. Just say hi and that's it. I'm not capable of call, as you can tell, the fact I shouted her name at her means I'm not <laughs> capable of it. In fact, my dinner party, let's have Martina Cole, because she was she was seemed like really good company. What a lovely lady. We'll have Martina Cole. <laughs> well done. Been an hour, she'd kick her out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, who's the most famous person you've ever met? <laughs> uh, I've, I've met a few actually. I've been very lucky that in the police, you, you obviously get access to people. Um, and I worked London for for some events like the Olympics and things. So I met quite a few people. Uh, I spent, I had a dinner with Dennis Irwin. I don't know if you, he's a left back from Man United in the nineties. Legend, lovely fella. Uh, I met Brian May at a gig. Uh, obviously the Queen <laughs> guitarist. Yeah, he was, he looks exactly like he does on telly. Another thing I said to him, which instantly made me lose my call badge. I mean, who says that? Of course he looks exactly like he does on telly. It is him. <laughs> but I said to him, you look exactly, yeah. I'm not very good with, with meeting people. Uh, instantly, my call's gone. Um, famous people. Uh, I did meet Lee Evans. I mentioned him earlier. Lee oh. Evans is 
what a lovely fellow he was as well. Like couldn't couldn't do enough for for the people that were um, around him. Lovely guy. Uh, who else have I met? It's famous. I've been the Man United squad was was all there for that dinner, but again, people probably aren't interested in in footballers. Well, some might uh, be, but yeah, yeah people not. are surprised that I actually know, but I know more than people. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a little the... fan for my sins. Oh, <laughs> oh right, yeah. Oh, you're yeah. not interested in football then? <laughs> I mean, we're in the championship now, we're fine. That's true, that's true. <laughs> I think the, my favourite person I did meet was, was Rick Mayle, who, who was um, a <laughs> legend and one of my favourite all-time uh, performers, comedians, whatever, writer, whatever you'd, you'd want to call him. And I met him um, briefly in London, rather bizarrely, I think he nicked my taxi. Yeah, he did. Yeah, it's true. I was chatting to him, uh, just bumped into him and with a group of lads, I was, and um, recognised him. And he, he was very uh, happy to speak to us when he probably should have walked away from a group of idiot lads and then um, he jumped in our taxi. And we, <laughs> fair play, he's a legend. He can have my taxi. Yeah. You did at least you call badge with him, did you? Probably. Uh, it's inevitable. I don't remember how, but I mean, he never called me back. <laughs> always you as a bastard, really. <laughs> I know, I know. I miss him. What a wonderful yeah. guy. Yeah, same. I, miss his stuff. I, know. I wish I'd never asked you this question. I'm so jealous now. I love Lee Evans. I love Rick Mayo. You have start. done well, haven't I? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I mean, none of us, we're not mates. Like I say, none of them have called me back, but um, I mean, you're talking. Uh, yeah, people I've bumped into and met. Yeah, that was it. One of my weird claims to fame is that um, Tony Blackburn used to come in the petrol station I used to work in, and I had to explain to him why oh, we right. kept people behind the counter. Very strange. Yeah, very strange. Probably very obvious. Yeah, well, you'd think so, but to him, not so much. And, uh, oh, wow. and I had Richard Maidley come in with Judy, and he asked to use our toilet. And because I'm an idiot, um, just so you know that it's not just you, I panicked. <laughs> and we didn't have one. Well, I mean, we had the staff toilet, but I told him that he had to go next door to the cafe because that's like just what I always used to say. And then afterwards, you I can't said, turn Richard Wade away, can you? That's, well, I did. And my mum's never forgiven me. She's just like, what? <laughs> can't what turn a national <laughs> treasure away from a toilet. <laughs> yeah. I, I tweeted him as well and told him, I said, I'm really sorry. I said, I don't know. And he's like, why did you say no? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, as long as he knows he's welcome to use your toilet any time now. I think that's... Yeah, well, I mean, I don't work there anymore, so... Oh, right. Yeah. Well, we're at your house then. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. God, my mum would, yeah. <laughs> also, they'd never get out alive. <laughs> um... Do you hear? Do you get much feedback from readers? Yes, I do. It's it's lovely. It's obviously one of the very best parts of uh, of sticking something out because when you do put a book out, it's a terrifying time. There's that sort of gap between putting something new out and, and any feedback whatsoever. And then when it starts coming in, uh, it's wonderful. I've got my own advanced reader team that I've sort of built up right from a lot of them have been with me right from sort of self-publishing days even the, you know certainly the first published book so that's that's incredible they're very quick to um to feedback and to let me know if i've done it right or wrong uh my feedback generally i'm going to touch wood if i may is is um is lovely very very strong and, and you know it's a wonderful thing uh, and i get people contact me that um uh, from australia and canada and and i've just had um some stuff translated into into czech as well and, you know you know, made up is is um, being read in in all over the world is is incredible. And they send me pictures of them on holiday, just to mock me the fact I'm not on a lovely beach. <laughs> you know, they're on a lovely beach with, with one of my books, and it's it is incredible. And it's it is definitely, like I say, the best the best part about um, about doing this. Really, I mean, that's why we do it. Otherwise, it's just me sat down writing down the voices in my head. You know, if there's no there's no readers at the end of it then that, that's um, be pretty pretty dire. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And I've run a mailing list on my website as well, and people sign up, and they always, well, yeah, 100% of them pretty much put a, a lovely comment on there as to why they want to sign up and 
you know, and I, I make sure to reply to everyone. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's fantastic. And from you feel like an imposter every single day. I, I think that's common from what I've heard from other other authors, uh, but never more so than when someone gets in touch and says that, that, that they like your stuff. You know, it's um, it's a real shot in the arm. It does masses for confidence. So yeah, I do get a lot of uh, a lot of people getting in touch. Awesome. Um, are you going to let your kids read your books when they're old enough? Oh, what a good question that is. I mean, they can read the one about the aliens in the pigeon suit. That's <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, when they're older, I, I hope they want to. I think that's the important thing, that, that they understand that it's um, it's an achievement. You know, any author that's got a published book, um, self-published, published by an indie or by the mains it matters not if you finish the book that's an incredible thing you know it's it's a very difficult thing to do and i hear authors running themselves down at the fact that they've they're self-published and um potentially not selling or or whatever that might not be because of the content and probably isn't you know books right time right place right cover right backing can make a success out of something that's not as good as you've done and are self-publishing you know and and uh yeah it's it's, a, it's an achievement and i just want my girls to want to read them you know, and to understand what, what it means to, to be a published author. Because for me, it's an absolute privilege. Uh, and I keep saying long may it continue, and I do mean that. Uh, and when people get in touch, as, you know, as regards to the previous question, it's, an, it's a massive privilege. Um, but yeah, they're allowed to. They're just not allowed to judge me <laughs> as a result. There was one uh, book, um, uh, her, there's one, Her Last Breath, and there were some torture methods in there. And um, I remember clear as day when after it came out, uh, my wife's mother read it and um, she wasn't particularly impressed with some of the torture methods. And they were all worried about my wife, just to say, you know, it was this sicko <laughs> that you were lying next to every night. <laughs> so, yeah, my girls, I just hope they don't judge me. Does your wife judge you? Does she read them? She reads them, yes. Uh, she was also a 12 year police officer. So um, we met uh, when we should have been working. Uh, so yeah, she, she reads them and she understands that it's all made up. It's not what I want to do. It's just how I entertain people. And I, as I always say, it's the readers that are the sickos. They're the ones entertained. You know, it's not me. <laughs> it's you lot. It's you yeah. lot that want to look at yourself. I hold my hands <laughs> up. I have no problem. But, yeah, <laughs> my reputation yeah. precedes me. It's apparently. not as... <laughs> Yeah, all the blood and the gore, people love it. So, um, yeah, she does read them. Uh, and she's she's the most difficult woman I've ever met in my life to to please. So, um, and she's always sort of grudgingly positive about them. So that's, uh, you know, it's nice. It does. <laughs> so she doesn't sleep with one eye open yeah. then. <laughs> Not that I've noticed, but I'm normally asleep or plotting. <laughs> <laughs> it's so it's romantic. <laughs> There's no romance. You made me forget my question again now. I can't remember. I was going to ask why a pigeon suit as well. It just occurred to me. Because they blend in, didn't they? They blend in. If you're an alien and you want to, you know, integrate with humans, what better? You can be in plain sight. You can peck around in the middle of a town centre. No one's going to look at you twice. That was a very quick answer. I feel answer. like. That's, that's obviously something that you thought, thought about. about. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, like I've sold that book. I feel like I've sold that book far better than the brand new one that comes out on the 1st of April. You know, like I've sold the pigeon suit and I haven't even finished it. You know, it's it's not available. And this is a crime group. And people want crime. And I've been selling the pigeon suit book. It's probably not but not great, is it? I should get better at, at the whole, um, you know, endorsement sort of side of things. Yeah, I mean, I'm intrigued as well now. I have the mentality well, to which doesn't help. So, but yeah, <laughs> I'm intrigued by the alien in the pigeon suit. <laughs> That wasn't what I was supposed to talk about. We'll talk about your crime book then. This is your okay. Tell us. Okay, tell well, us all about the new it. one. Let's talk about. Hang on, let me. I try not to give you a tour of my kitchen, but let me show you. So this is the new one. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, it's on a computer screen. Oh, this is the Tower of Books. See, this is what how I've been. <laughs> awesome. That's that's what my phone's balanced on. This is the behind the scenes. <laughs> element uh yeah so the friends uh, the first of april um first in a new series uh brand new di and a new ds 
uh, and similar sort of tone and pace to the, to the previous series. Uh, and it's about two families that have, have suffered a trauma, two separate families, uh, and they've never had any closure from the police. And they're approached by someone pretending to be a friend who gives them answers on, on what happened to their loved ones. And there's a lot of anger and um, a lot of uh, retribution that, that, that the families are after and the police are then playing catch up to find out why uh, bodies start turning up. Uh, and then by the end of the book, hopefully you'll be challenging as to whether the friend, what the friend's motivations were. So that's kind of a brief summary of that one. I'm really pleased with it. I always say that, but, um, but generally I wouldn't release anything that I wasn't absolutely delighted with. And this one particularly is, is very important. Uh, and I'm already well into, into the next. So um, I'm really looking forward to that one coming out. Uh, and obviously I've got the 14 books uh, back catalogue, the Maddie Ives series and, and the um, George Elms series. Again, I'm really, really proud of those. Uh, the Maddie Ives series, I said to you, was six books and that was six and final. That may not be the case. I think in the future, I'd like to go back to it. Uh, it was, Joffe are very much happy for, um, for us to continue with that. And, and I, I loved it. I loved the, the characters and you do get attached to a series. I think George has earned his retirement, but um, I do think Maddie might come back for another adventure or two, but we shall see. So that's that's kind of the books I wanted to talk about and probably should. <laughs> and so if anyone hasn't read any of your books before, which would you recommend starting with? Uh, well, the first one ever, and the first in the series for George is called Bodily Harm. And then um, He Is Watching You is the first one of the Maddie Ives series. Uh, so either of those two really. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm proud of both, both of the series. The very last one that, that was available is this one. That's The Deadly Houses. Uh, and the feedback for that has been really, really strong. Um, so again, yeah, really proud of that one. That series, like I said, I'm not entirely sure it's finished, but uh, it's at a point now where um, we can certainly take a break. <laughs> so you could read those six and, and um, yeah, there is sort of a, uh, a character art that starts from finish to end on that one. Awesome. Um, I don't think I've got any more questions for you then. I think that's it, unless there's anything else you want to mention. No, I've probably waffled on and taken up far too much of your time. Just just thanks that's again it. for for your time. And, and obviously to anyone uh, reading the books, uh, you make my day. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to read them. For people that review as well, you know, you don't have to review. No one's forcing you to, but we do appreciate it massively when that when that happens. And yeah, just thanks very much. Um, before we go, do you want to tell people where they can find out more about you and your books? <clears throat> yes, thank you. I've um, well reminded. I'm not very good at this. Uh, I have a website here. which <laughs> <laughs> I have a website which is writercharliegallagher.com, uh, and obviously all all of my books and stuff uh, is on there. Uh, and Amazon, of course, for um, for the books with Joffe. They're doing a, an offer. At the moment, the first seven George Elms books, well, all seven George Elms books are 99p for all of them, which wow. uh, for a Kindle box set is um, makes me angry and delighted at the same time uh, mm -hmm. because I might attract new readers and, and it works out about 14 pence a book. So I think that's cracking value. Um, so feel free to give those a go. <clears throat> but yeah, that's Amazon. Uh, the new one, The Friend, like I say, is up for pre-order at 99 pence um, and you can order up paperback copy advanced copy um, from Waterstones, uh, either going in there or um, on the old internet. So <laughs> either way, you can find me. And I'm on Facebook and Twitter, and I love talking to people, and this has probably put you off doing that, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> no chance. <laughs> That's it.